Hello, everybody. There. We are now live. At least I hope we're live. I'm hoping you're all managing to find this stream working again, and we're just going to set our timer and begin to get ready. Well, here we are again. What a great night. What a great day. It's just exciting to be here again um, in your living room or wherever you're viewing tonight. It's just a, a great opportunity to join together and be part of what's happening tonight. So hello, Lucy Angel. Isn't it good? Angel. It's a nice name. Wendy's there. Judy's there. Cool. Keep your names all rolling in. Amy there? Oh, I didn't see you, Amy. Where are you, Amy? Hello, Amy. Okay. Well, let's get going because if I name every person, it you know, I could be here all night just saying hello to everybody. Paul's watching. Cool. Everybody, come on, everybody. Don't forget, tell your friends, invite your friends, and um, make this a real opportunity to just let people hear these relevant messages that we're doing every every week, every Sunday. Well, I've got a great message tonight on um, on a great topic called death. So. It sounds gloomy to start with, and um, it, it sounds a bit frightening at the moment too when you think of people dying with this virus around the place. But um, my topic's not going to be uh, so depressing. In fact, it's going to be wonderful. I'm really looking forward to showing it. So obviously, um, there's many people died in the Bible, uh, but tonight we're going to pick on one of my favourites, and this is the well-known story of um, Lazarus being raised from the dead. So. While he died, which was terrible, there was an incredible resurrection, which was even more wonderful. So let me go and get my Bible, and we'll start to just unpack some of this sermon tonight. I've got uh, a few things I want to think about and speak about, and sometimes it's difficult for me because I want to say so much in such a short time, and um, it's just hard. I wish I had days and days and days to just be able to start to, to preach out of the word and just let people start to feed on the, the truths of what the Bible talks about. Anyway, we're going to read from, if you're looking in the Bible tonight, uh, where are we? John, chapter 11, verses 17 to 44. I just had to look back and check my notes to find that reference. So here we go, John 11. It's talking about the death of Lazarus, and we'll pick it up here um, in verse... 21. I'm just going to read some of the scriptures, and after that, I'm going to do a bit of an introduction, and then we'll break a few things out that I want to talk about. So here it says in um, verse 21, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died, but I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection. Okay, that's Martha and, and how she started to interact with Jesus on the death of Lazarus. Now let's move down a little bit and go down to here and talk about Mary. 32. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Now, I know often we talk about uh, Mary and we talk about Martha and many preachers preach and I've preached many times myself on how Mary, Mary chose the better thing to sit at the feet of Jesus and Martha was being chastised because she was being so busy organising and doing things and, and people kind of judge Martha for not being so spiritual but Mary more spiritual than Martha but in this story it's turned around. Uh, I don't know if you noticed that but it, I did and I hope it's correct. I hope my theology is okay. But in that part where Jesus is talking to Martha, Martha says, um, you know, 
But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus said, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection. You see that Martha had incredible faith at that time. She believed that Lazarus, though dead now, would rise again in the resurrection time and, and, and they would go to heaven. So there was faith that Martha had in, in this response that she gave back to Jesus. Now let's quickly look down to Mary. And Mary says this when she saw Jesus. She said, Lord, if you'd been here, my bro brother would not have died. And that's all she says. She's totally consumed. She's upset. She's been weeping. Well, both of the, like, the sisters were incredibly upset, emotionally upset. And, and it's fair dinkum to be like that. When somebody you love dies, you're allowed to be sorry and grieve. But, you know, here there's no kind of faith from, Ma from Mary. There's a, just a statement, if you'd been here. And that's it. But see, so Mar Martha in this part of this, this account was actually showing some more faith than Mary had. So I like that because it starts to bring into balance. So if we preach about how Martha one day was too busy and Mary was better, well, this sort of balances it around and, and shows you that Martha and Mary had a, an incredible uh, close walk with Jesus. They were his disciples. Uh, he, they followed after him and they had this wonderful relationship with him. They were very close to Jesus. And of course, Lazarus was their brother, and Jesus was very close to Lazarus. Okay, let me read another quick scripture. So this is when Lazarus is raised from the dead. Um, let me see. So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I knew that you, would, you are always near me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here that they may believe that you have sent me when he said this jesus called out in a loud voice lazarus come out the dead man came out his hands and feet wrapped with the strips of linen and a cloth around his face and jesus said to them take off the grave clothes and let him go and i, I remember years ago i didn't like this singer but there was this singer called carmen and he did an incredible uh, song about Lazarus and Lazarus coming forth. Now, I don't like the song, but I don't like the singer, but uh, Kerry does. But I do like the energy that it, it produces. And, um, you know, some of my fantasies of this scripture are, are crazy. But you see, Jesus said here, in a loud voice, Jesus commands Lazarus to come out. Now, they said the reason that he, he commanded Lazarus to come out was because if he didn't command Lazarus by name, then all the graves could have opened around anywhere and there would have been resurrections of people all over the place because that's the kind of authority that Jesus had over death. I mean, Jesus was God himself who had the power of life and death. And so it was important that Jesus mentioned Lazarus's name or else there would have been a few more people popping out of the tombstones and, and walking around. I, I don't know if there was any other Larises living in the area of his voice because if it had been, if he'd have had some brothers or twins or some other person with the name Lazarus, they might have actually popped out to life as well. So uh, my mind just goes crazy about those things. But we have to start to realise that Jesus had this uh, incredible authority of who he was. He was the, the son of God. He was Jesus Christ. You know, he was the Lord of all. And when he commanded things, things took place. And so he simply had to command the dead into life. And man, when you start to look at this story, there's just so many facets and truths about this account. But we can't go into all of those things or else we'll be here for such a long time. But I, I want to just, we've looked at some of those scriptures. And I would like you, when you've got some free time, to actually just go back and, and, and read through that whole chapter of 11, right down to, um, I'm having trouble reading, 44. So, John chapter 11, right through to 44. And just read it for yourself and just start let those words that were spoken, the account that was written, just let it start to speak into your heart and, and just start to see what, uh, what you can find in it, what truths are in there, what principles are in those passages that you can apply to your life. There's some great stories. I mean, the mind boggles, you know, the, the people said, oh, you know, Lazarus has been dead four days and he'll stink, you know. And Jesus said, don't worry, just roll back the stone, you know, roll it back. And 
and Lazarus came out and I'm sure the people were thinking, oh no, you know, it's the zombie movie all again, you know, and, and they were thinking it would be like a, some ghoul and some person with maggots hanging out of him and mouldy and, but he wasn't, you know, when they peeled off the layers of his clothes, he was perfect and in his natural form and, and normal as he, as he could be because Jesus put life back into him. It's a wonderful thing. Anyway, let me get my uh, iPad and we'll just start breaking some of this down. Uh, I just hope that some of this can um, ring something into your heart tonight, ring a truth into your heart. I, I want to preach tonight to again to give you encouragement. My job is, is not here to discourage people. We're talking about death, which is a, it can be a very tragic situation. And, um, you know, if you've lost people in your life or if you've been close to tragedy in your life, then you understand the seriousness of, of death and the loss of people, the loss of people's lives, finality. It's the finish. It's the end. Um, you know, it, it's a devastating. Let's not get away from the fact that death is devastating, not so much to the person that's died, but for the living and all those that have to be living afterwards where in the situation and circumstances. So I'm not taking lightly this whole situation of death, but what I want to do is I want to turn this around so that we can start to realize there is a there's a, an incredible biblical truth in this Bible uh, that tells us that uh, Jesus is all powerful. Jesus is all powerful and he has all power over death and hell and all things. And, you know, he, he is the answer for us. He's the answer for our lives. And he's, he's the answer for every need that we have and every difficulty we go through. Jesus is the answer. I know it sounds simple. I know it sounds cliche, but it's absolutely true. Absolutely true. And, you know, if you know it, you know it. And if you've lived it, you've lived it. And it's a wonderful thing to know that Jesus will help us through in all our life's journey. Anyway, my sermon. Let's get on to my sermon. So, tonight I'm going to talk about the Today Jesus. That's a great title, isn't it? The Today Jesus. As we looked at this beginning of these scriptures, we decided to look at this story of uh, Martha and Mary. And there was two beliefs that were formed in Mary and Martha's mind about the death of their brother Lazarus. So, there were certain emotions and there were certain thinkings that were taking place in their minds because of this difficult situation that they were going through. First of all, there was a belief in the power and the permanence of death. Wow, you know, when you face death, you start to realize that that is absolutely true. There's a power in death. There's a permanency in death. Most people, when they're dead, they're dead. That's the end of the story. And, you know, I remember, and this isn't anywhere in my notes or thinking, it's just popped into my brain box, but I haven't seen many dead people in my life, I must admit. But when my father-in-law died and I went to the hospital and I saw him in his bed dead, it was a, such a shock to, to me uh, emotionally. I, I looked at his face and although he was the same man, his face was the same, his hair was the same, Everything about him was just the same as when he was living. Now I was looking at this, this void. There was nothing in him. There was no spark of life in his eye. There was, there was no life in him. And it looked weird. It made him look like he was made out of clay or some pottery or some plasticine or wax. It, he didn't look real anymore. And it was a very powerful thing to me, not seeing that many dead people before. And, um, and you just start to realize, man, when you're dead, you really are dead. It's all over. It's finished. You're gone. It's, it's all final. So final. And, you know, Mary and Martha were, were going through this situation in their minds. You know, they'd watched Lazarus uh, become very sick and grow weaker and grow weaker. And they were probably worried for him and nursing after him and looking after his needs. And obviously they sent messages out to Jesus. Come on, Jesus, you know, Lazarus is, is close to dying. You need to hurry and get to his bed and pray for him while he's alive because he's so close to death. And so, you know, but they, they didn't see him get life. He became weaker and weaker and eventually he died and his body functions stopped functioning. He stopped breathing. His heart stopped beating. And then they'd seen him wrapped in burial clothes and placed in a tomb. Now, I don't know about you again, but... 
I went to a funeral once and Kerry was with me. And you know, we knew this this girl. It was a girl, wasn't it? The, the, in City Gate, the, the guy was the policeman. Oh, okay. It was a girl. And um, we knew this girl. She was part of our church. It was many years ago. That's why I'm a bit fuzzy. But um, we went to the funeral. And when they lowered the coffin into the, into the grave, and when they started to put up the dirt onto the coffin, it's like, wow, it hit home. She's dead. It's finished. There's, no, there's nothing coming out of this. We've been praying for healing for her for weeks and weeks, believing in healing for her life for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. And her husband was even expected her to be resurrected even at the grave. And Kerry too, she'd been praying and full of faith. She had more faith than me. But I went there and it was like, it hit me just like a ton of bricks. That, Man, this is it. This is the final. They're throwing the, the dirt on top. It's the end. And you can, you can imagine how Mary and Martha felt as they'd seen Lazarus becoming sicker and sicker and then he died. He, he, grasped, he gasped his last breath and he you know, held up his hand and said his little goodbyes and you know, fell back onto his pillow and that was the end. And then they wrapped him up in the burial clothes and you know, did all the things that they needed to do with that special anointing oil and all the things that they needed to do. And then they put him into a, a tomb and they sealed it. I mean, how final can you get? How completely dead is a person when they're buried and wrapped up in burial clothes and put in a tomb? And, you know, uh, the mourners had been weeping and wailing because Lazarus was uh, well liked by the people around him, by the community around him. And so there would have been many people uh, uh, crying and mourning and wailing. In fact, there's a tradition in, in, in the Jewish people that um, they do a lot of wailing and mourning and, and crying when there's funerals. Um, other people like the Italians and different ethnic groups do the same kind of thing. They, 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 it's like for English people, we are stiff up and lipped and, uh, you know, you, you just fasten your shoulders and you walk on with, a, you know, determination. But these other cultures, they know how to wail. They know how to mourn. They know how to cry and scream. And, you know, if you don't have enough people mourning at your funeral, then you actually hire people in. People had uh, hired in mourners if they don't have enough people. So there's more and more people coming. So there are professional mourners who hire themselves out to go and scream and wail and cry out and beat themselves and do whatever they do, because I don't know what they do, but do whatever they do uh, in these possession of a funeral. But, you know, there's something that's incredible about this that the Western society is sort of forgotten about. Western society, when someone dies, we don't like to face it. We kind of like to move on very quickly. We don't want to see people disturbed and we don't want to show a lot of grief and we don't want to see people uh, crying everywhere and we want life to go on. You know, yes, it's sad, but you know, life goes on. And sometimes because we've sanitized it and we've hidden it away from life, that sometimes we don't actually uh, go through the process of weeping and grieving properly for the loved ones that have lost, we've left behind. And, and I think we need to come back to that place, be like the Jewish people. Man, they let all their emotions go. They let all their grief come out. They didn't hold back and they weren't trying to pretend it didn't happen. And, you know, they just, they just released all those emotions. And it was healthy for them. It's healthy to grieve. It's, help, it's not healthy not to grieve. It's not healthy to bottle up our feelings and not be sad when, when the people around us die. It's important for us that we learn to know how to grieve. I mean, years ago, even in England, years ago, when people died, they would be left in the house for viewing and people would come and view the dead body and, and, and pay their last respects. In Ukraine, when people get really, really sick and close to death, um, they put the coffin on the footpath outside the house waiting for that person to die which is pretty weird, but um, it's, it's that whole thing of learning how we need to um, mourn and how it's all right for us to mourn. We can be upset, we can be, you know, even despairing, even uh, depressed. You know, we can have all these negative feelings because it's a very sad thing and we need to release those things out of us and, and come to the end of ourselves. You know, when you've cried your last tear and your tears have dried up, then you actually have the opportunity to, to, to move forward and walk into a new life and start again because you've, you've resolved all that situation. Many people don't go through those grieving processes. And our modern world today doesn't allow us to go through the grieving process very well. Anyway, 
Let me get on because I get carried away. Okay, the second thing um, that they believed, both Mary and Martha, they both believed that Jesus had failed them. They both believed that Jesus had failed them. Jesus had let them down. Jesus had not been there when he should have been there. Don't forget, Lazarus and Jesus were like best of mates. They had a close, lovely relationship. And, in, and Mary and Martha absolutely believed that Jesus had, been, had he hideously, horrendously let them down in their most difficult time of life, in their, their most despairing time of life, the time when they really needed Jesus to be there on deck for them. He wasn't there. You know, and you know, Jesus had often gone to their house and had hospitality into their house. And being with Lazarus and with that community, and and you know they're they're going, man, Jesus, you let me down. Now both of these ideas that death is permanent, which it is, and the fact that they felt that Jesus had failed them, that's really consistent to me to people who are only thinking in their natural minds. They're only thinking in their natural minds. They're not. Uh, they're not mixing any kind of spiritual faith into this situation. They're just going through the grieving process in, in their natural instincts. And, you know, sometimes I think in life that when we do go through these death situations, we are so overcome by the natural instincts and by the natural emotions of, of these things that our spiritual insight come, you know, shortens down. And people come along and think, well, you're not very spiritual. Why are you all upset? Why are you crying? Why are you despairing? You're not very spiritual. Don't you know he's gone to heaven? You know, yeah. does that help you when you're crying your eyes out because the person that you loved has died and you no longer can have them with you and you're, you've, you've reached the bottom of your barrel, the bottom of life, and someone pats you on the back and says, oh, you should be more spiritual. Oh, I hate that. I hate that. That's like Job's comforters. You know, I hate people that state the obvious, but you don't need that. What you need is love and encouragement. You need somebody to come along and put their arm around you and say, look, I'm going to weep with you. You're sad. I'm going to be sad. You know, together we're going to shed tears. Together we're going to go through the journey. I hate these things that sound so spiritual and that people say to people, but they are like putting daggers into the people's back. Because these people are already under this incredible pressure of the situation to then go and say, well, you've got no faith or where's your spiritual life or, you know, and, and man, it just puts them down, puts them down. But, you know, both Mary and Martha were not really so active in their spiritual faith. I said before that actually Martha showed a real, a real determination of faith in the statement that she said, she said to Jesus. So there was faith. Mary didn't have so much that so we don't read about it. Maybe she did, but we don't read about it in that account. So we can understand that when people are in a situation like this, that there's going to be incredible grief. You know, death is final. In, um, in Ukraine, when, when we say we talk about death, we say kaput. So if somebody's kaput, they're, they're dead. They're dead. And so I, I often say kaput because, you know, it's an easy thing to say. It's a very, that, that part of the language I can understand. And so I might laugh about it if you drop something, oh, that's kaput. And everybody laughs because, you know, they think it's funny and you're talking a bit of Russian, so it's good. But yeah, so when you're dead, you're kaput. It's the end. It's the finish. You know, Lazarus had no future. He was dead. Kaput. Mary and Martha had no hope. Jesus could have healed Lazarus if he'd been there on time. If it came when he was supposed to have come, he could have healed him. He could have raised him up from his bed and, and, and put life into his body. But it was all too late. I'm sure there's many of us today that can understand this journey that Mary and Martha are on. I'm sure there's a lot of people who have had grief in their lives. I'm sure a lot of us have experienced the death of a loved one that Jesus could have healed but didn't. Now I can already, in my mind, think of some people that Jesus could have healed but didn't. And they were my friends. And Jesus could have healed but he didn't.
a dream Jesus could have could have saved, but didn't. How many dreams are left on the ground, broken and forgotten? A need that Jesus didn't meet. A person who needed rescuing that Jesus didn't rescue. You know, these are the these are the tough questions that we have in life at times. These are the, the, the difficulties that we have to go through in our life as we live this journey of faith in God. Just because we're Christians, just because we love God and God loves us doesn't mean we have all the answers and we know everything we need to know. Life's a journey, life's a discovery, and indeed life is painful at times. And for this people, for this time in this situation, for Mary and Martha, it was a devastating experience for Lazarus to have died. Now, let me look at verse um, 32. Verse 32. This is Mary. Mary said this, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Now, this statement was actually spoken by both of the sisters. But let's just hone into Mary because Mary didn't add any more to that statement that she said. Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. You see, Mary's Jesus was yesterday's Jesus. If you'd been here, but you weren't. If you'd come yesterday, my brother would be alive, but you didn't. Mary had a Jesus of yesterday. They didn't understand why Jesus had not responded to their request to come. Even after they told him and told him that Lazarus was very sick. And they'd been waiting for him. And now it was too late. Now it was too late. Now death had consumed their brother. Death had finally come. There was no way out of it anymore. And Mary, you can see the sadness and the, and the sorrow, and the loss of hope, and there's no faith. And she says, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. You know, there was real regret. There was a real sense of disappointment in Mary's heart that she felt that Jesus had let her down so desperately. And it, it would have been wounding deep within her heart. You know, many of us at times feel that we've been let down by God. You know, that life hasn't turned out the way that we wanted it. Situations didn't turn out the way we thought they should have. You know, we might have gone through desperate times and prayed out in desperate ways, and yet we didn't see God answer those prayers in the way that we thought it would happen. And how many times have we sometimes also become disappointed, upset, hurt with Jesus, with God? You know, I remember a time in, in my teenage years when I was growing up and things didn't always work out. I, I thought to myself that I actually never hated God for what was happening. But the fact is I, that I rebelled and went against God and got away from God proved that in my heart there was a measure of me blaming God for the way my life was turning out. Even though I didn't directly speak it out, I think inside there was an action that took place that showed that I was really upset with God. That my life wasn't going the way I wanted it or planned it or thought that it should go. And I can understand how these guys would have felt. You see, it was too late. It was too late. Mary said, it's too late. Wow, what a statement. It's too late. Many people live their lives trapped by bitterness of missed opportunities. If only I had married someone else purchased that property, taken a job, made a different decision, but now it's too late. I'm a, I'm a prisoner of the past. And Mary was like this in this statement when she says, Lord, if you'd been here. Lord, if you'd been here. See, her faith was linked into Jesus' past. If he'd come, if he'd been there, she had, she, she had the faith that Jesus would have raised him. But her faith was in a Jesus of yesterday. 
it's too late. Let's look at Martha. In Martha, chapter 11, verse 23, In, oh, in John 11, 23. Thank you, Kerry. In John 11, 23, Martha says this. When Jesus encouraged, encouraged Martha with your brother, brother will rise again, she replied, I know he will rise in the resurrection at the last day. Martha believed in the future resurrection when every person who has ever lived will rise to stand before God. And we know that's true because in the book of Revelation it talks about there is a time when people die and there's a time when there's a resurrection and every person will go to the great throne and there will be a judgment come upon every life. Um, as Christians, I think we don't get that judgment thing, but we do have to give an account for our life and the way that we lived it and why we did what we did. But, you know, Martha had this clear, strong faith in the belief of the resurrection in the last day. She believed that every person would be resurrected and she knew that in that resurrection time that Lazarus would be resurrected with all the other people in that final resurrection. She had this faith that stood there and said, I know he's dead, it's over, it's finished, but I know, I know I have faith in God, I know that there will be a resurrection and, and good on her. Good honour that she had that level of faith at that particular time in that despairing situation that she could still crystallise those thoughts and believe for a, a life for Lazarus. But you know, Martha had a tomorrow Jesus. Her faith was in the day after the day after. It was in the future. It was in a future time that Lazarus would receive his resurrection. Why am I saying this? Because there was a scripture that I'm trying to find. Yeah. You see, this, Jesus made this incredible statement. And this is amazing. It's in chapter 11. John chapter 11, not Martha 11. John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. And Jesus said this after the death of, of Lazarus. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. I am. And when Jesus uses the I am, it is an incredible, powerful word. I am. You know, it's amazing when Jesus said I am, people fell over like they were dead. It's, it's an amazing word. He gave it to Moses to, to call the people out of Egypt. I am. And there's many I ams in the Bible. Actually, there is. Let me look. There's seven. Seven I ams in the New Testament where Jesus declares I am. But this this was when Lazarus had died and Jesus declared this. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. What an amazing statement that Jesus made about death. That he was the, the, the resurrection and the life. He was the life giver. He had the power over death. And whoever believed in him will live, even though he dies. You see, because, you know, we may die in our mortal bodies, but uh, the internal spirit and soul will live forevermore. Because God is the resurrection and the life, and we have his resurrection life within us, and we are born of the spirit and children of God, and we will be resurrected, and we will live forevermore. And it boggles my mind to think that we are going to live forever. I can't believe it. I'm excited about it. I actually can't wait for it to happen, but I will have to wait because I don't want to die just yet. I'm not in the dying time yet. Anyway, Jesus said this after Lazarus died. You can imagine what people were thinking. Lazarus has died, dropped dead, he's kaput. The two sisters are crying, the, the mourners are mourning, everybody's sad. And Jesus said, I'm the resurrection of life. Believe in me and you'll live. You'll live. Wow, what a statement. You see, Martha had the faith to believe that Lazarus would rise again in the, in the resurrection, but it was a future tense, a future time. It didn't help her with today's needs. It didn't help her that day that with the fact that Lazarus was now 
dead, wrapped up in clothing, placed within a tomb, and was finished. The, the words of Jesus at that time didn't bring her comfort in her today's situation, in her immediate situation. She had faith that looked forward to many years down the track when Lazarus would be resurrected. You know, many people live their lives teased by the hope of future success. <laughs> you know, many people in life, especially in Australia, are living for that day when they're going to win the gold lottery. <laughs> they're living for that time. Oh, you know, next year, next year, next year. They're living for that time when they're going to make the big win. Or they're living for, well, when I retire, I'm going to do this. Now, I've got those ideas now because I'm getting closer to retirement age. And I'm going, when I retire, I'm going to do this. But, you know, it's closer to that time, so I can do that. But it's not, it's not my only dream. If we keep just looking forward into the future and dreaming things of the future, sometimes we'll only dream of them. They'll never become reality because they, they're not actually taken into our present day and what we're going to do today. Sometimes, instead of doing actions for today... We dream of tomorrow and do nothing. And, you know, Mary was like this. She had a, a Jesus who was going to be active tomorrow. Tomorrow there will be a miracle. Tomorrow there's going to be new life. Tomorrow there will be a resurrection. But today, no, Lazarus is dead and we're sad. And Jesus, you were too late. Jesus, you failed us. Jesus, we're hurting. We're disappointed and we're struggling because they can't get past the fact that there's more than yesterday and there's more to tomorrow, but there is actually today. Jesus said this. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and life. He didn't say last week I was the resurrection. He didn't say next year I'm the resurrection. Jesus says, I am resurrection and the life. Jesus is a now, today Jesus. He's here for us today. He's here to help us today. He's here to give us strength today. He's here to give us life today. In, in our life, if we've lost things, if things have been given the death penalty, if things have broken and been destroyed around us, I want to tell you, Today, Jesus speaks life and says, I am the resurrection. Those broken dreams, Jesus says, I am the resurrection. Those people that you've loved and you've lost and you're still grieving with, Jesus says today, I am the resurrection. I am today able to help you and empower you and to help you move on and forward in, in the things of God because God still has a plan for our lives. Even when our plans fall to ruin, even when things don't work out the way that we want them to, then Jesus still is on the throne and Jesus still has a plan for our lives. Jesus is today, relevant today. You see, in this situation, when Jesus rose Lazarus to life, there were so many impossibilities. You know when we say sometimes, life's so hard, how can God help me? Life's so tough, I have so many difficulties, so many things are not right, how can God help? Well, can you imagine Jesus when he comes to the tomb of Lazarus? So many impossibilities. Lazarus's body not just only died, but had been ravaged by sickness for quite a time. So his organs and his, his health had been deteriorating and, and suffering and being slowly destroyed by whatever was killing him. So he, you know, his whole body was, was sick and dying and dead. He'd been dead for four days. Now I said to you before that, you know, Man, after four days, you're going to be, well, rigor mortis sets in, you know, and then, you know, your body fluids all start to go rotty. And, you know, if, if you ever push something over that's dead or move something that's dead, it's horrible. It stuff squelches out and it stinks. And, you know, now Lazarus was, would have been in this situation by now. He, yeah, the Bible said he stinks and he stinks. They went, 
when Jesus said, roll back the stone, well, oh, no, don't do that, God, don't, you know, don't do that, Jesus. Man, that's going to be a pong. We're going to smell such a pong if you roll back that stone because Lazarus has been there for four days. You see, the people in that situation, oh, boy, there wasn't much faith. There wasn't much faith in that group of mourners. There wasn't much faith. You know, Martha had a glimmer of faith. Mary really didn't have too much, we understand. And the mourners and the, the, the local people and the, those that loved Lazarus were devastated by the, the loss of their dear friend. There wasn't a lot of faith. But you know, um, the today Jesus, the Jesus who works in the now, the Jesus who is present with us every day and this moment, even this day today. See, let's never keep putting things off till tomorrow, thinking tomorrow it will work out. Let's take the day for what it is. Seize the day. Cup DM, the only Latin word I know. Cup DM. Seize the day. I want to tell you, Jesus is here for you to help you seize your day and to deliver you from whatever's been oppressing you and pushing you down and, and causing you to feel like something's died in your life. And there could be many things that have died in your life. I want to tell you, Jesus is the resurrection and the life. The resurrection and the life. The today Jesus has the power and authority and ability to raise, the, to raise Lazarus, restore him to health and strength and return him to his family. And the same Jesus as today has the same power to do that. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 8, it says here that Jesus says this, I am, it's that I am word again. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to, or is to come, the Almighty. You see, yes, Jesus does live in our past. Yes, Jesus does live in our future. But I want to tell you, he's active right now at this moment in our lives if we let him be part of our lives. I want to just read, what else? I did want to read something else. Let me see if I can find my Bible and just follow up one more thought. I'm nearly finished, which is quite unusual for me. Yes, this is what it was. It's here. Jesus said these words to the uh, the group of people. He said, um, Father, I thank you now that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefits of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. See, Jesus, uh, he didn't have to do all that shouting and commanding and, and, and doing what he did because he could have simply, he could have just winked or, you know, flicked his finger and brought life into Lazarus, but he called out and he commanded or the life into Lazarus, into his body, in a loud voice, so that the people would know that he was sent from God, he was the son of God, and he had the power and authority over death and hell, and he had the ability to raise the dead. And he wanted to prove a point. He wanted to show them that God was working on their behalf, that Jesus was there at their very present time of need. He wasn't too late. He wasn't too early. He was right there, right at the right moment. Not what the people's choice was. It wasn't their ideal situation for Jesus to arrive after Lazarus had died. But it was Jesus' timing and Jesus was making a point of this. And it was to demonstrate the power of God. That God had the power to put life into something that had been dead. Not just dead, but dead for quite a few days. Jesus wanted to display the almighty, incredible power, supernatural power of the resurrection life and, and be evident in Lazarus as he walks out of that grave. 
in perfect body form, you know, with just he wasn't like newborn. He still had his wrinkles and everything else, but he was healthy and strong and living, which is incredible. But I want to just give you this other scripture. It says here, it says here. So we understand now a man named Lazarus was sick. This, this Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. So we hear the sound that there's a message going out to Jesus that the one he loves, Lazarus, is sick. I mean, really sick, not just like sick with a cold, not sick with the virus, but on death's bed. And um, when he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. Jesus said that. Can you imagine? That's what Jesus said when he heard the news, when he heard that his best friend, his mate, his good mate, was so sick he was nearly dead. Jesus goes, the sickness will not end in death. You see, Jesus knew the plan of God. Jesus understood the times of God. Jesus knew how to walk in, in, the, in the, the faith and the timing of God himself. And he could have this great, incredible faith. Right then he says, this will not end in death. It will not end in death. But the guy dies. It di he dies. Well, now if it, was be if it was your local preacher down the road who prophesied on such and such a day, this will happen. And on that day, turned up and nothing happened. That preacher would walk away pretty, you know, um, what, depressed? He would, oh, if he were the prophet, he'd be stoned, yes. Kerry said that. Um, but he would feel rejected. He'd feel embar very embarrassed. I hope he would feel embarrassed, you know, because what he said didn't happen. And here's Jesus making this incredible, incredible statement. And he said, this sickness will not end in death. And yet the very fact is when he gets there, Lazarus is dead. You see, Jesus knew the end of the story. God knows the end of the story. We, we don't know our story. We think we know so much. We know our beginning and we know the middle part of our, our situations, but we don't know the ending. You don't know the ending of your life. You don't know, know what God has got in store for you. You don't know how God is going to help you live such an incredible life in him. You don't know the end. But I want to tell you, I don't know the end, but I can promise you it's going to be good. Because God is good and God's favour is upon us and God wants to bless us and give us a great life. And he wants us to walk in his spirit and in his liberty and his favour and his blessings. God has only good things for you. We don't know the end of the story. But it's going to end good. In the very end, it's going to be great. And you know, Jesus said this, his sickness will not end in death. He says, no, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. You see, there was a reason why there was a reason why Jesus delayed his trip to go to see Lazarus. Jesus could have got up straight away and got down to Lazarus and got to his house and, and went to his bedside and, and, you know, just prayed a healing prayer in his life and, and raised him off that bed of death. Jesus could have done that. He had the capacity. There was nothing that he, you know, he couldn't do in that situation. But it was not God's timing. It wasn't God's timing because God was setting this up to be an incredible miracle. An incredible miracle. I mean, how big a miracle do you want? I want these kind of miracles. That, that They're miracle miracles as far as I'm concerned. I mean, you could pray for somebody with a headache. Can they get healed? Oh, great. You're a headache. But raising someone from the dead, wow, that's an absolutely amazing. And, you know, I'd love to see that happen. I would. And I know people have. And I know people with a great healing ministry have seen the dead raised. And, and praise God for that. And people are being raised from, from death to life. Believe it, it's happening even today. Because, you know, Jesus is still the same yesterday, today and tomorrow. And he's still raising the dead today, no matter what the scoffers say and what people say about God. God is still doing miracles. And God is still proving himself and showing his power to those that will see and those that will believe. God is still doing these things today in our lives. Miracles are not finished. But what an incredible thing that Jesus 
allowed this whole story to just um, continue on, setting the stage, setting the atmosphere, uh, allowing the time for things to go the way they should go. So when he comes, there's going to be this incredible um, grandstanding experience of seeing Lazarus brought to life. The most impossible miracle that you could imagine uh, came on that day into that tomb, into that man. And, you know, the whole village would have seen and talked and that news would have gone out and spread out into all the communities and many, many people would have heard. And, you know, those that didn't believe would have believed and many would have turned to Christ because of that resurrection life. But I want to tell you today and tonight I want to finish with Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Whatever has died for you in the past is in the past. Whatever your difficulty you're going through right now in your life, broken dreams, broken promises, maybe Jesus has arrived too late for your situation. Maybe you feel Jesus let you down because you, you, know, you reached out in faith or you prayed and, and you didn't get your prayers answered. And you feel Jesus has let you down. I want to tell you today is the day when Jesus can do a miracle in your life and bring back life, resurrection life. He can resurrect promises. He, he can resurrect your dreams. He can resurrect your future. He can resurrect your marriages. He can resurrect all the things that the enemy tries to steal off us. He can bring back to resurrection life. And you need to believe it today. And you need to take it into your heart today. Don't be like Mary and Martha who they couldn't see anything but death. Don't become so disappointed in life that you can, can't see a way out of it. Don't be locked up in despairing for what happened in the past. You know, you do need to grieve, but you do need to move on. If you're still grieving over something that you need to stop grieving for, stop grieving. It might be a job. It might be possessions. It might be a partner. It might be many things, but if you're still grieving over something over after many years, there's a time to stop grieving and there's a time to move on and open your eyes and believe for a miracle from God to change the situation. And I'm praying tonight, right now, that God is going to put new life into your hearts today. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. Jesus, will you just pour out your resurrection power into every heart that's listening to these words? Will you, Lord, equip them and bless them and bring miracles into their hearts and lives? Will your timing be perfect, Father God? Because our timing... It's not our timing. It's your timing, Father God. And we don't understand. We think we know so much, but we know nothing. God, we give you into your, we give our lives to you tonight. That you will work in us and work through us. That you'll lead us and you'll guide us. And you'll, you'll put success and favour upon our lives. But you'll do it in your timing. And you'll do it in the way that you want to do it and not the way we think it should be done. Father God, help us not to be disappointed or overcome with discouragement or become embittered against you, Father. But God, let us be people of faith that believe that, Jesus, you are today working actively in our lives. Today you are the miracle-working God. Today you are the resurrection and life. And I speak that over your lives today. If you're going through death situations, Man, there's so many things that can destroy people's lives and hearts. And if you're going through those things, I speak life into you. Because, you know, the word says the devil comes to seek and destroy and to kill. The devil comes to seek and destroy and kill. But Jesus comes to give life. Give life eternal. Give life to the full. Give life with promise and success and favour and blessing and outpouring of generosity. That's the kind of life that Jesus gives us as we wait on him and we receive it in faith by him. I want to tell you tonight, don't live under the curse anymore. Get out of the curse. Get out from under that curse that's cursed your life. The devil has been trampled under the feet. And Jesus has given us the power and authority, just as he had to speak life into Lazarus. Jesus gives us the authority to take our lives into victory. 
Jesus, will you just release people tonight? Put faith, hope, fresh hope. God, deal with their past. Lord, let that burden of hurt be dissolved in Jesus' name. Let the regrets of past failures be melted away in the name of Jesus Christ. God, let those missed opportunities and regrets and failures and mistakes of the past, let them be washed away right now in Jesus' name. Let this be a new day today. Jesus, come in a fresh way in the people's hearts and lives this day, Lord God. Forgive them of their past, Father God. Wash their sins away. Set them up for their future and for their tomorrows, Father God. I pray let there be a sense of love and mercy and grace poured into their lives. Give them fresh hope to believe that, God, you can turn all things around and not only can but want to and will do, Father God. Lord, I release your grace and love into people's lives today in the name of Jesus. Thank you and amen. Well, guys, thank you for watching tonight. I pray that this will have touched your heart. You know, all of us uh, in life, uh, go through these situations I've been talking about tonight. All of us have issues in life. Not, not one of us has a rosy life. Not one of us has the perfect life. But I want to tell you, God is good. God is good and God is faithful. And when we can't see, he knows the way. When we can't understand, he understands. You know, God knows our future. He knows our future. He knows our past and he knows our today. What do we know? Are we going to let Jesus be today in our lives working for us? Amen. And God bless you.